Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to the fifth episode of ICPA clinical series. The objective of ICPA clinical series is to solve one clinical challenge in each episode. And today we have the fifth episode and we have a priv our privilege to have Dr. Rohit Khatakar with us, MDS Endurontics. He is a visionary micro endurontist known for his proficiency with a variety of endurontic equipment and latest gadgets. He did his BDS from Nair Dental College in Hospital Mumbai and MDS from Rangunwala, Pune. He is a routine user of dental operating microscope for over 10 years. Dr. Rohit is the founder of Vision Micro Dentistry Training Academy in Mumbai. It trains dentists on magnification and microscopes in dental practice. Now, something very interesting. Dr. Rohit is a proud contributor to Grossman's Endurontic Practice 12th edition, released in 2010. That's a great thing, Rohit. Presently, Rohit is the key opinion leader for Densply, Serona, and Zumax. And he is also a teaching faculty at D.Y. Patil Dental College, Navi Mumbai, for their fellowship program in endurontics. So when I spoke to Rohit for the fifth episode, he said, let us not talk about very complex issue. Let us take something that's a challenge for a beginner as well as a seasoned practitioner and something that forms the core of dental practice, that is access cavity in endo uh, cases. So today he is going to speak on how the trends have changed, how things have moved from conventional designs to unconventional designs. So Rohit, the show is yours. Thank you, sir. So uh, very good evening to all of you um, and all those who have joined on YouTube and through the ICPA page, as well as my friends in Endor Valley. Uh, I, Dr. Rohit Kataukar, welcome all of you for this uh, small webinar. Um, for those who know me, uh, I am having my practice in Mumbai and I'm also quite active on social media. So uh, for those who want to learn more a little bit, I ha also have a YouTube channel. So you can uh, check it out and have a look. Uh, we will be discussing one short topic this time, but there is a lot more to discuss in endurontics and a lot more new concepts. So you can uh, take it ahead as it goes uh, at maybe at a later date, we can have a webinar on some other topic, right? Uh, so <clears throat> this is where I practice in Mumbai. I practice uh, at Santa Cruz, very close to the domestic airport. And I have a two chair practice, which is uh, focused on endurontics and restorative dentistry. And uh, I strongly believe in using uh, the power of magnification, not just for endurontics, but for dentistry in general. And uh, that's why I have named my training academy as Vision. Uh, the focus is to do better dentistry with the help of magnification devices, whether it is a basic magnification device such as loops or one of my personal favorites, the use of a dental operating microscope, which gives us a enhanced visibility in our working field. So with this, I started the concept of training various dentists in the use of loops the kind of endurontic treatment that you perform on a daily basis. Okay. So, so far we've had participants from across the country and also some who have traveled across the globe to learn to do better endurontics. Okay. So my assignment for today is going to be on access cavity preparation in endurontics. And we start from the very basics uh, that is conventional access cavity preparation and go to some unconventional ideas and concepts with regards to access. So let us first unravel the mysteries of the pulp chamber by having a proper access opening before we start our endurontic treatment. Now the formula for endurontic success has been more or less the same over the past 50 or 100 years. Uh, that means you have to correctly diagnose a case, do a proper access opening, instrumentation that is your cleaning, shaping and obturation. With the new concepts and new ideas, new techniques, materials, this formula has become a little more complex. But at the same time, these newer things which have got incorporated for us dentists have made our life a little bit simpler and easier to perform the same procedure. Right? <clears throat> the objectives of our access cavity preparation are going to be the same whether we do a conventional or an advanced access cavity. 
So we will first try and remove all the caries when there is a presence of carious lesion. Try and conserve sound tooth structure as much as possible. Unroof the entire pulp chamber so that we have good amount of visibility. Remove all the coronal pulp tissue before we go and access the radicular pulp tissue. Try and locate all the canal orifices so that we know how many canals we have, instrument and subsequently disinfect. And try and achieve a straight line access to the at least the straighter portion of the canal. Or in case you have a straight canal, then right up to the apical forearm, right? Before we start our access cavity preparation, it is very, very important that we study our preoperative radiographs for at least a good five minutes. And what do we do when we study our radiographs? We try and locate the internal canal anatomy, try and locate the position of our pulp horns, canal orifices, the location of the roof and the floor of our pulp chamber, and also a very important landmark that is the cemento enamel junction. Now, why is the cemento enamel junction so important? Because it is the only landmark which is seen both radiographically as well as clinically. And this will be important when we study our access cavity preparation. <clears throat> so sometimes even the simplest of cases can turn out to be difficult. Like this premolar, for instance. If you would not have studied this radiograph properly and started an access cavity just like that and try and locate that one canal which we presume was there in this uh, particular tooth, you would have ended up missing an entire canal. Okay. So that's why it's important that we take our time and study the radiographs before we start our access cavity. Now, most of the times we take a regular intraoral pediapical radiograph for our access cavity preparation or diagnosing the case. Uh, in case of maxillary molars, many a times there are a lot of structures or the adjacent teeth which might overlap. And this does not give us a good idea of the dimensions of the pulp chamber, which is important before we start our access cavity. So in such cases, bite wing radiographs are really helpful for diagnosing and locating the positions of the canal orifices, uh, checking the pulp chamber height, positioning of the pulp horns, and that is good for both the maxillary as well as mandibular posterior teeth. <clears throat> Sometimes we also need to take angulated radiographs which give us an additional information in terms of the positioning of the canals, location of the pulp chamber and the extent of the pulp horns. Of course, today we have better radiography and visualizing techniques in the form of a CBCT. So if you do have access to a CBCT in your city or town, please do make full use of it because it does give us additional information as far as locating the canal anatomy is concerned. Many a times we get an idea of the internal anatomy of the tooth before we even start the case. And it's in such cases, especially when you have difficult anatomy, it really helps to have knowledge of the case beforehand, before we start doing our access. Now, when we do our access cavity preparation, there are some basic tools that you can start with and certain advanced tools that you can invest it with as you move on to the next step of your clinical practice. So as far as basic tools are concerned, we need certain diamonds, that is an endo access diamond, and certain carbide burst, like a safe ended carbide burst. In case of ultrasonics, and magnification in the form of loops or dental operating microscope can be your next step in investing towards doing better access cavity. Now, when we talk about a conventional access cavity for anterior teeth, classically, we have been taught in our undergraduate college that we have to start with a position that is 90 degrees to the lingual surface of the tooth, go in and get a dip, after which we change the angulation to a more longitudinal angle that is along the long axis of the root. So first we start at 90 degrees, then move our position to an angle that is along the long axis of the root. <clears throat> now this is true when you have a young patient or a pulp chamber that is extremely wide. But if you have a patient who is elderly or a case where the pulp chamber has constricted, if we try to do the same thing, what you will end up is just drilling into more and more amount of dentine and possibly end up into a perforation along the buccal surface of the tooth. So we have to radiographically first analyze the size of the pulp chamber, 
if your pulp chamber size is narrow or constricted in such cases we have to opt for an access cavity that is along the long axis of the tooth and more closer to the cingulum of the tooth rather than starting right in the center of the tooth which you would start in a younger patient or a conventional access cavity preparation when it comes to mandibular anterior teeth there are certain cases which can be again tricky to do our access cavity when especially when you have two canals as the tooth itself is one of the smallest teeth in the oral cavity doing an access cavity preparation in the right position is important if we do our conventional access cavity along the incisor edge or along the buccal surface of the tooth what would happen is we would end up locating only the canal that is the buccal canal in most instances and many a times we end up missing the additional or the second or the lingual canal in such cases we might need to extend our access cavity at the expense of the cingulum as you can see in the two occlusal uh, sorry in the access cavity images the one on the top has a single canal so we can afford to have a smaller or a narrower access cavity where you have two canals in that case you need to extend your access cavity more in the bucco lingual direction so that both the canals can be accessed easily now uh, around 4 to 5 years back i uh, realized that there are there was a lot of confusion with regards to uh, choosing a good access cavity preparation kit and i worked uh, with this company called cross and we designed this access cavity preparation kit which actually covers most of the clinical situations that you would come across now you don't need to use all these seven birds for one single tooth for any access cavity preparation in fact for a particular case i would not use more than two birds but this is an entire range of birds which will help you for your basic endodontic treatment as well as the retreatment cases so this is uh, one of the birds that i would start off using for almost about 80% of my cases which has a combination of a round and a tapered cylindrical burr so the round burr reduces any chances of the burr slipping when i start my access cavity preparation and the tapered cylindrical burr also helps me extend the access cavity along the lateral surface of the tooth with regards to access opening into a metal ceramic crown or a zirconia crown these specifically designed burrs are help are going to help you to avoid any ceramic chattering or cracking when you try to do an access cavity through these crowns so these can be used for both pfm crowns as well as zirconia crowns for your gaining your initial access into the tooth surface after which we can switch to our regular or conventional burrs when you have a pfm crown in such cases the initial ceramic will be removed by the previous burr and that would be followed by using this particular burr for removing the metal now this burr is not designed to remove a crown or to cut across a crown but rather to cut through the metal of the crown so this the height of the burr is very less which is normally the thickness of the metals which would be somewhere between 2 to 3 mm to the maximum beyond this you can always move to your conventional burrs and then continue your access cavity preparation this is a special burr which i have designed specifically for areas where you need to work in a very narrow portion of the tooth uh, for lower anterior teeth for nb2 canals for locating additional canals along the mesiobuccal to the mesiolingual canals of mandibular molars this particular burr is very helpful so this is designed for truffing along the isthmus areas of these particular teeth now when we talk about uh, access cavity preparation for posterior teeth the designs of the access cavity are by and large dictated by the presence of our canals as you can see in these images which i have taken from uh, ingles endodontics that the location of the canals is going to be always slightly more mesial in the posterior molars that means whether it's mandibular or maxillary molar they are always going to be positioned more towards the mesial surface or the mesial half of the tooth whereas in case of premolars usually it is going to be very much in the center of the tooth so let us take a look at some of the clinical cases as i described to you the problems and the solutions that we can uh, overcome uh, these access cavity issues
So this was a case with, which was uh, referred to me for a retreatment when patient has undergone root canal treatment just about six months back. As you can see on the preoperative radiograph, there is clearly one canal which is missed and the other canal is severely underfit. So the first thing we will do is analyze the case and look for the problems that we have to deal with before we start treating the situation. So we did a conventional access cavity preparation here right in the center of the tooth and we will always presume that there would be two canals in a maxillary premolar. If I do find a canal which is right in the center of the access cavity preparation, in this case, I would probably not think of looking for a second canal. But if one of the canals is slightly off the central uh, groove or, or the central uh, line angle of the tooth, in that case, I would definitely look for a second canal approximately equidistant from that position. Say from the central groove of the tooth, I find the buccal canal, which is about two millimeters away then generally two millimeters in the opposite direction, I should be able to locate the palatal canal as well. So as we had already predicted, I did find both the canals, that is the buccal as well as palatal canal. We negotiated and removed the existing gutta percha and negotiated the canals to the apex, confirmed with the gutta percha point, and that was the down pack, back fill, and of course we removed all the existing restorative material and redid the entire restoration as the pre post endodontic restoration. Okay, so we have to make sure that our uh, bands and the wedges and the rings are absolutely perfectly adapted, and that's where magnification really helps us to check this before we start doing our post endodontic restorations. That was the series of radiographs and the final radiograph. <clears throat> now, when it comes to using advanced tools or equipments, one of the limitations that our conventional high-speed drills have is that the head of the handpiece always, always limits our visibility. So when we have the head of the handpiece located right above the occlusal surface of the tooth, we are almost having zero visibility. So this problem is actually solved with the help of ultrasonic tips. So ultrasonic tips actually have the entire tip which is much more compact and the handpiece gets pushed further away from the occlusal surface of the tooth. So we have different types of ultrasonic tips that are available and there are certain specific tips which are designed to be used in the coronal third, some of them made for the middle third and some specifically for the apical third or for irrigant activation. So please check the scaler that you have and accordingly purchase a corresponding tip. As far as access cavity preparation is concerned, there is only one tip or one series of tips which I would recommend to you that is the Startex tips. These tips are specifically designed for working only in the coronal portion of the chamber and not meant to be used inside the canals. Okay? So there is a series of tips from one to five which can be used. Amongst these, the Startex 2 is one of my personal favorites <clears throat> and that can be used for access cavity refinement. Now, this is a very good statement which I uh, always follow that fail to plan is a sure short plan to failure. So when you do your access cavity design, it's always better that we plan the access cavity so that we can have least amount of collateral damage or destruction when we do the access cavity preparation. So I always prefer to map access cavity according to the position of the different canals. So usually I have a canal, uh, an area which is marked for the mesobuccal, one for the palatal and one for the distobuccal, the three basic canals. And that would be the limit of my access cavity preparation. So let's have a look in this particular case, which was of a young patient, maxillary first molar, which had a deep existing respiration. And it ended up being non-vital patient came to me with severe pain. So this was an absolutely intact and healthy tooth which just had a very deep class one cavity preparation. So what we did is we tried to conserve maximum amount of the tooth structure, but for doing this, I had to plan my access. So what we did is I used a very basic OHP marker, which you can get from any stationary shop. We mark these points on the patient's tooth, and these are going to be my limitations where I will not extend my access cavity preparation. So as you can see, after doing my access, I try and have a access which is as conservative as possible and practical, after which, if needed, I can always modify the access cavity design.
Now it is important that you also have good visualization and we try and remove any restrictive denting so that we get better visibility to the canal orifices. So here you can see the MB1 and MB2 canal orifices after only coronal preparation and removal of any coronal interferences. We have still not done any cleaning shaping of the particular tooth. Same way in case of mandibular molars, I would mark these points. Uh, of course, from the radiograph, we can get an idea whether we are going to expect to have three canals, that is two mesial, two mesial and two distal, uh, sorry, two mesial and one distal or two mesial and two distal canals and approximately uh, map our axis cavity. So when we do our axis cavity according to our mapped plan, we should be able to locate the mesial canals immediately after which we can extend the axis cavity to locate the distal canals. So this way we can get both the mesial canals and the distal canal with least amount of collateral damage. So conventionally a round bar and probably a safe ended diamond were what was recommended but like I mentioned personally I prefer to use a endo access diamond bar which has a rounded tip and also has an ability to do side or end cutting. Uh, the advantage is that the burr is non-slip, just like a round burr, but it's not going to just create a ditch. It will also help you cut on the sides. And once we have got the adequate depth, we can then switch to a safe-ended burr like an endosy or a carbide burr. Now, when we do our <clears throat> conventional access cavity preparation, one of the most important criteria is that we de-roof the entire pulp chamber and have smooth and flaring walls and have a good visibility of all the canals, no overhangs as far as possible so that there is a clean visibility and clean operating field when we start doing our instrumentation procedure. But one very important thing that we have to keep in mind is when we are not able to locate the canals, please do not use these burrs for locating additional canals. When we have located the basic canals or maybe sometimes we end up locating only one or two canals, not located the entire three or four canals that we would have expected, we end up getting frustrated and we start using the same burrs along the entire surface or along the floor of the chamber and then we end up creating more problems. Right. So this was one of the cases where the dentist had actually tried to locate additional canals, probably did not find the canals and then ended up creating uh, incorrect location with the birds. So we had to retreat this case, uh, end up uh, creating a small barrier for avoiding any perforation and that was the final radiograph. You can clearly see that the case was almost uh, going to be a perforation in the uh, area where the dentist had tried to locate that additional canal. Okay, So please use a DG16 Explorer when you are unable to locate the canals after doing your access cavity preparation and don't use the burrs to locate the canal orifices. Okay? Sometimes the cases can end up being disastrous where there was a huge perforation over here and patient came to us with a severe amount of pain and we actually ended up locating both the canals and they were extremely close to each other where barely about 0.5 millimeters away from each other. But look at the amount of damage that has happened in the process of trying to locate the canals. Okay, So we did end up saving this tooth, but there was unnecessary amount of tooth structure that was already destroyed before we even started off the case. Now, when we want to locate these additional canals or even the basic canals, some basic rules can be used. Uh, these have been laid down by two authors, uh, Dr. Krasner and Rankov, way back in 2004. Uh, during my post-graduation, under the guidance of my teacher, Dr. Vivek Hegde, we wrote this article uh, and I will just present to you some of the images from the article that will help you try and locate the canal orifices when you do your access cavity preparation. So uh, these images are going to be uh, helpful for you to understand the different laws uh, the first couple of laws are related to more on the mandibular molar teeth, uh, not so for the maxillary molars. So the laws are pretty simple. Uh, in the first image, you can see a red line that is drawn across the buccal, uh, the mesial to the distal end of the mandibular molar. And as you can see, 
that the canals are located at a point which is equidistant from this particular red line. So the red line runs through the entire length of the tooth and the mesobuccal and the mesolingual canals are equidistant from the line. In the fourth image, you can see where in a case where you have four canals, the canals are going to be located at a point which are equidistant and at the same time perpendicular to this red line. So you can see those yellow lines which are perpendicular to the red line, which are going to be the positions of your mandibular teeth. So with this in mind, we should be able to locate the additional canals or try and find out four canals, if at all there is a presence of them in mandibular molars. The only exception to this rule is a case of radix endomolaris, where you have an additional root uh, which is separate from the conventional four canal mandibular molar. So this is easy to find out because you can see that additional root on the preoperative radiograph. So there is no doubt in your mind that we have to find this additional root and usually it will be slightly off from the conventional position of the canals. Usually it will be a distance around of around one to two millimeters away from the regular position. But if you are able to locate at least three canals, the location of this fourth canal becomes easier. The other law of pulp chamber states that there is a law of color change, which states that if you have a pulp chamber floor, which is visible, in that case, the pulp chamber floor is always going to be darker than the walls of the chamber. So if you are able to visualize a very shiny area or a white patch, usually it would mean that you have not derooped the pulp chamber or there is a pulp stone or a calcification that is present on the surface of the pulp chamber floor. So once that is removed, we will be able to see a much darker floor, which will indicate that you have completely derooped the pulp chamber. The same thing is visible in this particular clinical image where you can see a cl clear distinction between the darker floor of the chamber and a much lighter wall of the pulp chamber floor, uh, pulp chamber uh, in the particular tooth. <clears throat> the, there are certain other laws for orifice location which basically state that the orifices of the root canals are always located at the junction of the walls and the floor. These orifices are also located at the floor and wall junction, which means that once you have a conventional axis cavity preparation, at the junction of the floor of the pulp chamber and the walls of your axis cavity is where you would normally find these canal orifices. Now, if you have not damaged the floor of the chamber, which is why uh, I recommend you to use a safe and dead carbide burr. If you use diamond burrs, there is a high chance that you would destroy the floor of the pulp chamber. So this actually has the developmental fusion lines, which give us a map or an idea of the position of the canal orifices. So in certain cases, you can use these uh, disclosing dyes. You can use a methylene blue dye, or here I've used the green case indicator dye, which gives a good contrast and gives a better visibility of the canal orifices. Now, for the beginners, a very small tip that you can start off with is to use a front surface mirror instead of using your conventional rear surface mirror. Uh, there are a multiple number of brands which are available today uh, who are dealing with these front surface mirrors. Uh, <clears throat> either of the brands, uh, either of the companies are going to give us the same amount of quality. There would be a slight difference as far as the reflectivity is concerned. Uh, so uh, images from mirrors such as Zerk, which I personally use, are going to be one of the highest reflective, uh, reflectivity images. But uh, the conventional front surface mirrors will also provide you with distortion-free visibility. Right? So when we are concerned about finding additional canals, very important thing to note is that first, our standard access cavity preparation has to be made. Try and locate the basic canals at least, and then we will try and hunt for the additional canals. But that would be done only with the DG16 Explorer and not with birds. Now, which teeth can have additional canals? So, almost all the teeth in the oral cavity can have variations. So, the only rule is that there is exception to every rule. So, you should be aware of the variations that can exist, whether it is in an anterior tooth or in a posterior tooth. So, there can be two canals in incisors, multiple canals in premolar teeth, 
and mid mesial canals, mid distal canals, as well as MP twos in maxillary or mandibular. Uh, sorry, maxillary first or second molars. So a key important step here is to use magnification when you do your access cavity preparation. So please do invest in a very good quality magnifying device. Uh, you can start off using a pair of loops and then slowly if you wish, you can always progress to a more advanced device such as a microscope. The light from this uh, device, whether it is a microscope or a loop, is going to give us enhanced visibility and that is going to help us improve our access cavity preparation design. And then we can consider doing a unconventional or conservative access cavity preparations, right? So with regards to the newer concepts in access cavity preparation, there are a multitude of access cavity concepts which are available today. So today the conventional access cavity preparation is known as traditional access. So what was conventional or the norm earlier has now become a traditional access cavity approach. And today we have conservative, ultra conservative, ultra conservative, incisory driven, or caries driven or restoration driven type of access cavity concepts. The same thing will apply when it comes to posterior teeth as well. So you have a traditional access cavity, conservative access cavity design, ultra conservative uh, trust access, uh, caries, uh, caries directed access or restorative restoration directed access. Now these different concepts basically aim at to trying to conserve the amount of original tooth structure and try and cause as less collateral damage as possible. Now, what is very important is that we also need to have a good amount of access to locate the canals and subsequently do our instrumentation procedures. For having a good amount of access and visibility, it is important that we use some form of magnification. So if you are not using magnification in your dental practice, I will definitely not recommend you to start doing these access cavity preparations. Now, as you can see from the access cavity designs, it is not difficult to make a small hole and start locating the canals. Okay, any of you can do it. It's just making a small hole and then try and locating the canals. But the key factor here is to try and have visibility through this small hole. If we are not able to have visibility, in that case, we would end up creating more problems than trying to solve a problem that the patient has come to us with. Okay, So please do not try to do this because you would end up having problems. And we will discuss one such case at the end of the presentation to understand what sorts of problems you can come with. So there are different concepts, like I said, for access cavity reparation in terms of doing modern access cavity. Uh, these are some of the access cavity concepts that I follow in my practice. And I will show it to you in form of some of the cases so you understand why these concepts are the ones that I personally like and not all of them or not one of them specifically. Okay. So one of my most favorite concepts is to do a caries directed access. Now, as we all know, majority of the patients who come to us with pain in the particular tooth is going to be a result of caries which has approached or is almost approaching the pulp. So the logical thing to do is for caries. In most of the cases, once you remove the caries, you are able to access the canals or at least into a part of the pulp chamber. So this helps us get some guideline as to where the extent of our pulse chamber is going to be and subsequently try and extend this access cavity to locate the rest of the canals. So this is one of the concepts that I always follow. If I, wherever there is caries, I will first try and remove all the caries. If the caries is not very deep, it's not approaching the pulse chamber uh, or it is in an area which is much further away from the access cavity, in that case, I will restore that tooth either with a composite or a glass eye number as a temporary measure and then start my access cavity preparation in the area where, is, where it is needed. So <clears throat> usually caries which is located in the mesial surface of the tooth becomes a little easier uh, spot to try and locate the canals. But every time you may not have a case where there is caries on the mesial side. 
So here we had caries along the distal surface of the tooth. Uh, for me, luckily, once I removed the caries, I could directly get a drop inside the bulb chamber. And this helped me uh, do a conservative access cavity preparation. As you can see here in the image taken on the occlusal surface of the tooth, it's a very unconventional access cavity. But I was able to locate all the canal orifices and subsequently instrument and obturate them. Okay. In the post-op radiograph, you can see the amount of carious destruction that was there along the distal surface of the tooth. And there was honestly no point in trying to modify my access cavity and go along the mesial side where, where there was already so much damage along the distal surface. So this was a relatively easier case because most of the canals were straight. There was not too much of a curvature here. So the risk of causing any problems was on the lower side. This was another case where we had caries along the major surface. And as soon as I started removing the caries, I could <coughs> visualize the pulp chamber immediately. The tooth was hyperemic and the patient did come to us with severe amount of pain. So we did a pre endodontic buildup, send the patient back. And in the next visit, now you can see the two mesial canals as well as the distal canal through the conservative access cavity. Now, the important thing to note here is that because we are doing the access cavity preparation under magnification, we are also able to locate the area between the isthmus or the area between the two mesiobuccal and the mesiolingual canals. We are located to, able to locate and clean the isthmus, able to locate and see if there is a presence of an additional canal between the two orifices. And that is the reason we can afford to do a conventional, uh, sorry, a conserv conservative access cavity preparation. If we do not have visibility, in that case, definitely I would advise you to go for a conventional access cavity preparation where you derove the entire pulp chamber roof and then try and gain better access to the canal orifices. Same thing with the distal canal. Now, one important thing to note again when we talk about conservative access is usually we will not be able to locate all the canals in one image. So that's why I have to tip or tilt the mirror to locate the mesial canals and the distal canal in a separate image. The same thing with the post-operative radio uh, image, you can see the gutta percha which has filled the entire mesial canals and the distal in between and same way in the distal canal as well. Okay. This was the immediate post-operative uh, image, the radiograph with the post neurotic restoration. As you can see, the entire axis is more towards the mesial surface and even the distal canal is completely along the entire axis cavity, along the entire length of the long axis of the root. Okay. Uh, in the angled radiograph, you can also see that the distal pulp horn has been preserved. We have not extended our axis cavity towards the distal surface rather reduce the destruction or collateral damage to the tooth as far as possible. So this is one of the advantages that you will get with a conservative access cavity preparation, which is caries directed. <clears throat> now, sometimes we can go completely unconventional in cases where we have an old restoration or old failed restoration, where I have here tried and removed that old restoration and we located the canals immediately. So from this class 5 or a cervical cavity, uh, we located both the canals and then we were able to negotiate. Now the important thing here is that we are using heat treated nickel titanium files. If you are using conventional files or files which are not flexible, in that case again you run a risk of separating these instruments during your instrumentation phase. Okay, so Definitely doing our access cavity preparation, shaping, obturation in such cases is a challenge. So it's not a case that I would routinely do or routinely perform this kind of an access cavity preparation. So here we had uh, to complete this case in one visit. Patient uh, had to uh, travel out. And of course, she was informed about the not so good prognosis of the tooth as far as the restorative is concerned because you can see that the entire buccal cusp is severely undermined. But imagine if we had done a conventional access cavity preparation, we would have destroyed that entire buccal cusp. There would have been no cusp left at all. There would have been about half the tooth structure uh, than what I have preserved at the moment. 
and definitely that would have further weakened the tooth probably i would have ended up extracting the tooth if i would have done a conventional or a very wide access cavity preparation in this particular case okay the second type of uh, access that i would uh, normally perform is a conservative endodontic access or a minimally invasive access so here also i want to make sure that i can visualize the entire pulpal floor and avoid destruction of unnecessary enamel or dentine wherever possible and the important part here is that we have accessibility along with our access okay which means that when we do our access cavity preparation like you can see in this particular case which was an endoperio case uh, there was no damage to the occlusal surface of the tooth but there was a perio involvement which had led to this tooth becoming non vital so we could afford to do a conservative access cavity preparation here in this case we have the same landmarks that we are using for our conventional access cavity but the dimensions or the extent of my access cavity is much lesser as compared to <coughs> i'm sorry as compared to what i would do for a conventional access cavity design so <coughs> just to give you a perspective on how small this access cavity is i have placed the rubber stopper on top and you can see that the rubber stopper itself is barely fitting on the occlusal surface of the tooth but i have not compromised as far as locating the canal is concerned as far as this when infecting the tooth is concerned or as far as removing the pulp chamber tissue or locating the canals additional canals if at all present are concerned this is what is important when we do conservative cavity preparation we have to make sure that we are performing all the steps of endodontics properly and not compromising on those steps just because we want to make a small access cavity design so this was my immediate post op and as you can see from the post operative image uh, we have completely avoided extending the canal uh, extending the access cavity along the palatal and the distobuccal side try to keep it as to, as much as possible towards the mesial side and at the same time not compromise on our irrigation disinfection and our obturation technique <clears throat> now when we talk about conservative cavity preparation it is important that we perform the basic steps of endodontics as well which means that we just don't want to make a small access cavity we want to make sure that we are removing all caries so this is going to be our first step in designing any access cavity whatever the tooth might be first try and remove all the caries to structure that is present after which we will plan our access cavity design so that's what we did in this case we removed all the pulpal uh, sorry we removed all the uh, caries to structure and then realized that we have a hyperemic tissue over here after which instead of using our conventional air rotor burns we switched to ultrasonics so ultrasonics helped us create a access cavity which is as conservative as possible at the same time maintain a good amount of visibility so these are the statex tips which are in action you can see that the tips are working smoothly and it helps remove the entire conservative uh, sorry the entire dentine and create a conservative access cavity preparation <clears throat> so in this particular case there was an interesting anatomy that we had two canals on the mesial side and on the distal root there were three canals which you can see in the uh, screen so this is an image post operative image and you can see on the radiograph that we have located uh, these multiple canals and these can be appreciated on the angled radiograph so as you can see in the post operative image <clears throat> there is a massive amount of tooth that was destroyed because of the caries lesion but here we have to try and reduce the amount of excessive amount of tooth structure that is removed during our access cavity preparation by that means we can create a conservative cavity preparation <clears throat> and the reason i prefer to have or maintain good visibility of the pulpal floor is because as i said there are always exceptions to every rule so you have multiple multiple canals that can be present in the mandibular molars or maxillary molars as well and these cannot be visualized if you make a extremely small access cavity preparation like ninja access 
or truss access where there is no amount of light that is uh, reaching the floor of the pulse chamber. So this is one of the reasons why I prefer to have a conservative access cavity reparation, not a extremely ultra conservative or a ninja access or a truss access unless I have possibly a CBCT taken for each and every case. And in that case, I will probably take the risk because I have some additional information which is available with my CBCT, which tells me the number of canals that I can expect before I even start my access cavity preparation. So if you don't have a CBCT, if you are not using a microscope, then please don't attempt to do a ultra conservative ninja access or truss access because these are not predictable in each and every case. Yes, one or two cases you might end up doing a good job, but it's not something that you can do consistently in each and every access cavity preparation. Okay. The third type of access that I prefer to use is a strategically extended access cavity preparation, which means that we will try and remove all old restorative material, uh, especially when you have restorations like amalgam, remove all secondary caries under this existing restorative material, and then extend our access cavity where it is necessary for the purpose of accessibility. So this was a case which I had treated many years back, uh, almost way back in 2010, where I just started using uh, my microscope. And uh, the first thing that I did in this case is remove the old amalgam restoration. So as you can see in the images, you can't see any traces of the old amalgam. This was a case where the patient had come with a cracked tooth syndrome. There was a crack that was running across multiple areas on the occlusal surface of the tooth. But as you can see, in the excess cavity preparation, the access has been quite conservative. So you can see the mesobuccal one, two, and some portions of the distobuccal and the palatal canal. So this was the second molar which has a mandic, which has a maxillary, uh, sorry, maxillary second molar which had an MB2. And uh, there is a 10 year recall of this particular case. So the advantage of doing a conservative cavity preparation here is that we maintain and preserve maximum amount of tooth structure so that a subsequent prosthesis can be given to the patient and we don't end up giving a prosthesis only on the core buildup material. We at least have a good amount of sound tooth structure that is remaining. Another case where we had a old amalgam restoration and the patient was symptomatic, patient had severe amount of pain. The first step I would do is try and remove out all this old amalgam and then try and locate the pulp chamber, try and locate the orifices and subsequently have and maintain good visibility to the floor of the pulp chamber so that we are sure that we have located all the canals. We are sure that we have removed all the coronal pulp tissue before we try and remove the radicular pulp tissue. Some cases like this, when we can afford to do a conservative cavity preparation, uh, this particular patient had recently visited to, uh, me after he uh, got his old on uh, inlay dislodged during the COVID uh, <clears throat> pandemic and he could not get access to a dentist to get the root canal treatment done. So at the end, uh, sorry, the restoration done. So at the end of this whole year, he ended up having severe amount of pain and sensitivity on this tooth uh, because this had remained open for almost a year. And you can see on the palatal root, there is also a lesion uh, on the radiograph. So what we did is we used up this space and we did a access cavity reparation as conservatively as possible so that we could manage to save maximum amount of his sound tooth structure. In this case also, you can see that the size of the access cavity reparation is just barely the size of our stopper, which is placed vertically. But at the end of our exercise, at the end of our endodontic treatment, we are able to locate, clean, shape, disinfect, and obturate all the canals as effectively as possible, whether I would do a conservative or a conventional cavity preparation, right? <clears throat> now, for those who of you who are listening to the webinar, a uh, very important topic uh, of discussion is to not try and copy these things without having the adequate armamentarium. Like I said, if you have the burrs, if you have the tooth, the patient, Please do not try these access cavity reparations if you do not have proper visibility. 
if you don't have visibility you will end up creating more problems because we don't know where we are placing our instruments where we are trying to locate the canals whether we have missed the canals where whether we have disinfected the canals adequately or not okay so this was one of the cases which was referred to me by a colleague who was probably uh, inspired by all these things that we see today on social media and he tried to make this conservative access and the first instrument that he placed inside the canal immediately broke and snapped so this is how uh, he referred the case to me uh, because this was a patient who was very close to him and he didn't want to end up spoiling the case furthermore as soon as he started out the case immediately first thing that he did was he snapped the instrument so he stopped the case then and there and that's how he came to me uh, with this space to try and save uh, him out of this problem so as you can see uh, this was the access cavity that he had done on the left it was a pretty conservative access cavity preparation and all i had to do was modify this access cavity because here the mesobuccal and the mesolingual canals were located slightly away from each other and of course with his hand instrument he was he managed to place the file in the canal but as soon as the rotary file was placed inside it immediately snapped so with the power of magnification and better visibility and the modified access i could easily find a position which was uh, a, a space right next to the instrument i could pass my hand instrument alongside and during my shaping procedure we also managed to dislodge this instrument and take that out and you can see the post operative images and the radiographs that was a conventional uh, access cavity which was modified and tried and kept as conservative as possible okay so to sum up this presentation i would like to uh, point out few important things one is to try and plan out your access cavity preparation in correlation with your radiographs the occlusal anatomy of the tooth and also the long axis of the roots of the tooth because ultimately we have to access the roots try to use the right tools and burrs for your access cavity preparation and at the same time try and invest in a good magnification device and have illumination because they are going to play the most important role as far as access cavity preparation uh, is concerned when it talks about conservative access and try and maintain a good accessibility for our subsequent endodontic procedure and always try and work within your comfort zone if you are not able to get these tools please don't try to do heroics and try to do uh, conservative preparation which creates multiple problems start doing a conservative preparation only after you have the adequate tools okay with that i would like to thank you for your time and thank you uh, icpa for giving me this opportunity to present my views and some of share some of my thoughts on this particular podium thank you thank all you very much. much you can get in touch with me in case you want to uh, discuss anything related to endodontics or know more about our upcoming uh, training programs thank you so much rajiv sir for this opportunity thank you rohit it was an amazing lecture i know must have been very very informative especially for the youngsters uh, fresh practitioners so many take home points from this lecture for a treatment as basic as root canal treatment uh, for example it is very very so it's so critical to have good knowledge of the anatomy to know the laws the rules that you said have the right instruments and uh, use magnification so that you can remain as conservative as possible without causing any kind of collateral damage and protecting as much of tooth structure as possible and i must congratulate you for designing the instrument kit that you have done. i think it is a great uh, thing for Maybe. beginners i will solve a lot of problems whatever they had to think you have already thought about and you have already created it so it, it looked amazing for me to me and Maybe. i think people should make use of it okay uh, great great attendance a lot of viewers and a good number very good number of registrations and i have a lot of questions here let me read them out to you let us take one by them uh, take them one by one by one the first sure. one is how to prevent perforation and find all the canals in maxillary and mandibular molars okay so like i discussed in the webinar one of the most important things is to follow the level of the cj 
so if you are following the level of the cj what i usually do is i will uh, place the burr alongside the external surface of the tooth and mark the level of the cj which i can see the junction of the enamel and the dentin if the tooth there is recession definitely it becomes easier to locate the cj if not then you can always use a periodontal pro uh, and try and locate the height of the tooth and that height is going to give us the depth extent or the depth of our access cavity reparation i will not go beyond this depth because at this depth usually i would be either in two places either at the roof of the pulp chamber or somewhere right in the middle of the pulp chamber definitely not at the floor of the chamber the second thing that i can suggest to you is to use safe ended burrs which will uh, be used immediately after you got slight amount of drop so that you are 100% sure that we don't end up accidentally uh, working on the floor of the chamber and perforating the chamber all right great uh, let me take a question from the live audience does root canal curvature dictate the access opening uh yes definitely if you have a curved canal in that case i would try and get my access cavity positioned in a way that at least i am able to reach to the first curvature in a straight line access after which the se second curvature that is there that is inside the root will be accessed by my rotary instruments if i am doing a very conservative access right at the coronal portion the first curvature that i am going to get is at the level of the orifice after which the second curvature is right inside the canal so that is going to make my task a little bit difficult and increase my chances of instrument separation we don't want that to happen all right i think the same the same answer is applicable for this question also i'll read it out sir how to negotiate and maintain patency in severely curved canals especially mb canals yes so once you have a straight line access and then you get patency with either your 8 or 10 number files uh, it is going to be easier to maintain the patency if you are having a initial access which is uh, straight line if you have a curved access that is going to make it difficult for you to remove the existing debris and then maintain the patency all right next question can small access be a norm is it possible in conventional endodontics no like i said in the webinar if you are not having the adequate tools please don't attempt to do a conservative access cavity preparation it is easy to make a small hole but it is difficult to maintain visibility so don't do follow conventional cavity preparation uh, if you don't have the adequate tools great how to preserve oblique ridge while access uh, while doing access opening of upper molars so uh, for those who have been practicing since many years or those who are beginners i would advise the same thing even i do this today if i have rotated teeth or difficult teeth uh, to access i use a regular oht marker and draw the access cavity design on the occlusal surface of the tooth on the patient's mouth okay don't worry don't do this that you can do this only on extracted teeth you can do this in the patient's mouth uh, after which you can use a alcohol and cotton and just wipe out those lines if you don't want the patient to see what you are doing okay but do this and uh, you can just mark that entire oblique ridge black or red so that you know that you are not going to cut on that oblique ridge the red line is going to be our in your access cavity Okay, so that is a good way for you to remember where to stop. So always plan and draw and never cross the boundary. Play safe. Yes, yes. Okay. As Next such, question. under the oblique ridge, you will not have any canals, so you don't need to extend. Yeah. So even if you go there, you you are not going to get any benefit out of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Does a rotary file system influence access cavity design? if yes how uh so yes if you are using conventional nickel titanium files the ones that do not have shape memory they are a lot more stiffer as compared to the con current heat treated files that are available so regardless of the manufacturer there are multiple companies which have come up with uh, heat treated file systems 
so these can be used very easily with uh, conservative access cavities so if you are not using heat treated files if you are using only hand instruments then don't attempt conservative access because those files are stiffer and they will uh, not be able to negotiate the coronal interference so forget about going to the radicular interferences or the curves all right next question i am not able to see the floor of pulp chamber as it appears completely black to brown even after using chair light please tell the solution for this problem okay so few things i am guessing that since she is talking about a chair light she is probably a beginner so uh, if you can invest in a led chair light in in in, in uh uh as opposed to your halogen light that will still give you a little better visibility uh the second thing that you can do is to buy front surface mirrors because they will take most of the light and then reflect it down into your access cavity preparation and third thing you can do is uh, soak the entire pulp chamber once you have gained access with sodium hypochlorite if there is any blackish brownish area which is probably uh, chronically uh, infected tissue pulpal tissue in that case that would get dissolved and then you would have better visibility of course the other things that we spoke about in terms of magnification having a illumination along with your loops all these things will help but these three basic things will help you solve most of the problems okay uh, so you you got an immediate reply for your answer thanks sir for replying to my question which are the heat treated files so uh, there are multiple files available is uh, um, you have uh, pro taper gold available from densply sirona uh, you have true anatomy files which are also available from the same company uh, there is wave one gold so these are some of the heat treated files that i use in my uh, clinical practice uh, there are also some good files called endostar files from uh, poldent uh, these are also heat treated files so any of the files where you can bend the instrument and it stays in that same position uh, these are good files that you can use for conservative access cavities all right uh, how to approach severely curved canals in molars and premolars i think this has already been answered yeah is next question is unconventional access preparation good while using conventional methods for disinfection and obturation <clears throat> so as as i said if you are doing conservative cavity preparation in that case we have to probably also think of changing our instrumentation and uh, our uh, disinfection obturation techniques okay so with regards to disinfection i would prefer to use some plastic type of activation devices like sonic devices like the endo activator i would definitely not use ultrasonics or any metal based activation devices because chances of these tips breaking are on the higher side when it comes to having a conservative or unconventional cavity preparation uh, the second thing uh, is that with regards to obturation if we are not able to get a uh, good straight line access in that case doing uh, lateral compaction becomes difficult so today we have uh, option of using something like bioceramic sealers so they can be used uh, bioceramic sealer with a single cone technique can be used in such cases for doing your obturation all right i think we have come to the last question now how mm -hmm. to modify the access cavity in premolars with deep split <clears throat> so again straight line access access and area which is deeper of the canal so to access an area deeper in the canal we have to make sure that we are not getting any resistance in the coronal part so getting a good straight line access and visibility uh, to the straighter portion of the canal will help you negotiate that deep split i think rohit you will have to repeat this because in the initial part your uh, audio was not clear okay. this so answer this case, answer right so in case of any canal which has a deep split it is again important that you have straight line access and visibility till the straight portion of the canal okay okay amazing 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 presentation and total justice done to the topic and i am sure the audience had a great time getting clarification over the entire spectrum of access opening 
right from conventional to unconventional i thank dr rohit khatakar from the bottom of my heart yeah. for accepting my invitation and doing this brilliant lecture and uh, i uh, i would like to tell the audience that people who missed watch missed watching this lecture live you will get the link of the recorded lecture very soon of course we'll send you the a short summary of this lecture as well and uh, so keep watching icpa clinical series soon we'll be back with our sixth episode and we'll announce the next topic of the episode and the theme is always each episode one clinical challenge so once again dr rohit thank you so much for being here with us and see you soon in on some other occasion on some other topic thank you so much thank good night so all much. of you thank bye you. good night good night